This is Dark Wings by Phyllis Eisenstein. The house seemed large and empty now that her parents were dead. It was also so soothingly quiet that Lydia would sometimes just stand in the high ceiling dining room and relish the silence. No shrill voice came floating from the upper story, no gravelly grating, one, grating one from the oak paneled study, no orders, demands, advice, admonishments. Electricity was gone from the air, leaving nothing but solitude. She dreamed of such peace, dreamed as the years of her youth ebbed away, eroded by a struggle she was too weak to win. Dutiful and self-sacrificing, people had called her, nurse, maid, cook, buffered between her parents and the outside world. Behind her back, she knew they had clucked their tongues over the poor, dried-up spinster. What did they know of the guilts and fears that her parents had instilled in her, the elaborate net of obligations they had spun about her, so she was bound to them with ties that only death could sever. And death had come, at last, like a knight on his pale charger, borne away two coffins that set her free. Still people clucked their tongues, because Lydia lived much as before, alone in her parents' house, alone in her heart. If anything, she was quieter than ever. Yet some things had changed for her. She painted a great deal more these days, uninterrupted. She moved her studio from the basement to the big bedroom upstairs where the light splashed in from windows on three sides. On fine days, she would open these windows and let the sea air wash away the smell of paint. In the evening, she walked by the shore, sharing it with tourists and young lovers. There were no responsibilities to call her home any particular time. Some nights, she would be there long after the noise of traffic had faded to nothing, till only the bell of a distant boy remained for company. She hardly thought about anything at those times only enjoyed the dark and the starlight on the waves and the blessed, blessed silence. On one such night, she saw the bird for the first time. The moon had risen as she watched. Its light splashed like a pale and shimmering highway crossing the restless ocean toward Europe. Like a shadow upon that path, the bird caught her eye. <clears throat> In dark, its dark wings, limbed by silvery radiance. For a moment, it glided over the waves, pinions motionless in the still night air, then it swooped upward and vanished in the darkness. She stood a while by the shore, straining her eyes for another glimpse of the creature, hoping it would wheel and make a second pass over the glittering water. It was a hawk of some sort, perhaps even an eagle. Size and distance were deceptive out over the ocean, where there were no references to judge by. She wanted it to be an eagle, for they were rare in these parts and protected. She had only seen a live eagle here once before when she was a small child. Though she waited till the moon was high and shrunken, she saw the bird no more, though perhaps she heard the beat of its wings far above her head. Perhaps she only heard the cool surf beating at the rocks below her feet. At night, by the sea, time, distance, and direction all seemed to muddle together, playing tricks on the eyes, the ears, and the mind. At home, she could not sleep for thinking about the bird. Before dawn, she was in the studio by yellow artificial light with a fresh canvas and dark acrylic pigment spread over her palette. Swiftly, she recreated the impression of the scene, the silver moon path, the dark bird and instantaneous silhouette, all surrounded by an impenetrable black that seemed to suck light away from the hard, sharp stars. Blue-black she used, instead of true black, Prussian blue, the velvety shade so dark that only a careful eye could tell it from black, but warmer somehow, softer, deeper. The sky and the bird, Prussian blue. When dawn added its radiance to her lamps, she saw that she had not captured the mood of that moment. The canvas was dull and dim. Her dilated pupils had perceived a patch of luminous, ethereal night in a vaster darkness. The paint had given her only the latter. Light, she thought, as she cleaned the palette and brushes. Light. All she could remember was the plumage of the bird, blacker than black under the silver moon. She slept. Later in the day, she walked down to the shore, earlier than usual. This time she carried binoculars, hurriedly purchased in town. She scanned the seaward sky from north to south, searching for a familiar silhouette. Gulls, she saw, gulls in plenty, soaring, swooping for food, perching on rocks, fat gulls, gray on top and white beneath. No hawks, no eagles. She turned the binoculars westward toward the rooftop of the town, which is visible beyond the intervening trees. She saw flecks that might be pigeons, crows, even sparrows, near and far ordinary birds. Nowhere did she see the short head, broad tail, and flared wings that marked her quarry. She ate a quick dinner and returned to the painting by the wanning, rosy glow of dusk. 
One could not evoke the depths of night, she thought, under a bright sun. She lightened her palette, reworked the moon and the sea, even the dark air between them, trying to capture the radiance against which the birds had seemed so intense a shadow. Past midnight, she realized that there was a contradiction in her mind, a double image of that instance, in which the sky was bright and dark at the same time. She could feel it. The painting was only a poor reflection of that feeling, two-dimensional and by now muddy. She cleansed the palette and brushes and set the canvas aside against the wall. Stifling a yawn, she mounted a fresh black canvas on the easel. The bird this time, nothing else. She sketched quickly, placing tail and flared pinions, adding details that she felt rather than remembered. The light was moonlight, of course. There was no sky, no ocean, only the dark wingspan and the merest suggestion of curved beak and piercing eye. When she reached the limits of both of her recollections and her invention, she went downstairs to the study and looked at eagles up in the encyclopedia. She knew now that it had been an eagle. She wouldn't allow it to be anything else. Encyclopedia illustrations gave her some inspiration and corrected a few of her assumptions. She hurried back upstairs to make adjustments. By dawn light again, she viewed her new effort with a critical eye. She'd never painted birds before. At most, she'd, she'd, they had been pieces of background in her few landscapes, a brush stroke or two in the sky. The black eagle showed her lack of familiarity with his kind. He was naive and awkward, though bold. If she squinted, she could see a family res resemblance to the birds on the back of a dollar bill. At twilight, she walked by the shore, searching the darkened sky for him, staying on till the moon was high that night and many after. Night upon night, as the moon waned and the stars brightened by contrast. Night upon night, in fair weather and foul, when the, when the waves were slick as glass, when the waves were wild things clutching for the sky. She waited for another glimpse, straining at clouds or a late gull or a speck of flotsam on the water. She waited late, late, and past midnight she returned home and worked on one of the other of the paintings, striving to recreate the bird. She'd never gone to town much, less since the deaths of her parents. Now she had no use for the place at all. She had her groceries delivered and paid her bills by mail. Every scrap of her spare time was spoken for by paint or binoculars, the sleep that she grudgingly allowed herself. When the postman saw her, dropping off a few bills, catalogs, advertisements a couple times a week. And the people who walked by the sea. The weather was beginning to grow chilly for both tourists and lovers. Soon the moon waxed full again. Only Lydia stood on the shore to watch it touch the waves with silver. She heard the bird now. Sometimes she was sure of that, but she never saw his broad dark wings. She heard him beat the air once, twice, high above her head, and there was silence as he soared and she stared upward, trying to pierce the blackness with her human eyes. She thought he could probably see her well enough, Eagle's eyes being so much sharper than humans. She tried to imagine how she must appear to him, her face a pale speck amidst the darkness of rocks and scrubby grass. A small thing, earthbound, no significance to a creature who sailed the dark ocean of air. What would it be like, she wondered, to have wings and look down upon the creatures who could only walk? The paintings had prolifer proliferated by this time. They lined the studio, view after view of a subject she had seen only once. If there was a clear image of him in her mind's eye, that she could reconstruct his whole form from the sound of his wings. His eye, she knew, was golden, like a great amber bead set about the corner of his beak. The beak was dark as his plumage, like polished jet. And to display their true span, the great black pinions would require a canvas larger than any Lydia had ever worked. She contemplated ordering the proper size from Boston, stretching it and preparing it herself. She measured the door of the studio to be sure the finished product could be carried out of the room, and then she made the phone call. Autumn was waning by the time the painting was well begun. The sea breeze that washed her studio was chilly by day now and gusty, though she still opened the windows to it, painted wearing an old sweater. When she walked by the shore, she could see scarlet leaves floating among the restless waves. The color of the ocean was changing, too, and the color of the sky. The daytime world was beginning to gray out for winter. Only at night were the changes invisible. At night, the boys still clamored far out on the water. The moon still splashed its shimmering highways to Europe, almost at Lydia's feet. At night, ebony wings beat the air. Lydia strained for a glimpse, just a single brief glimpse, of the bird that glided somewhere somewhere in the vast, unchanging darkness. The days grew shorter. 
as the chilly wind ruffled the waves to a rest of froth, the nights were long, long for walking by the choppy water, long for painting by lamplight. Lydia slept the whole short day through now, seeing the sun only at dawn and dusk. The bird preferred the night hours, and Lydia had begun to understand that preference. The day was jarring, stark, revealing too much of reality. Night was kind and soothing, hiding the world's flaws in velvet. At night, Lydia could look into her dimly lit mirror and see the girl she had once been, the girl whose skin bore no sign of wrinkling, whose hair was yet untouched by gray, whose life still lay ahead of her. That girl could walk on the shore and dream dreams. She could look upon the moonlight, the moonlit highway to Europe and imagine herself traveling it, light as a feather, eastward over the horizon. She finished the painting half a dozen times. At dawn, she would step back from it, cock her head to one side, and nod to herself. She would clean the brushes and palette carefully then, go to bed satisfied. When she woke at dusk, the light of the setting sun showed her flaws, approximations, incompleteness. She would eat a quick breakfast and go out to the shore again, in search of her model and inspiration. Inspiration she would find in the clang of the boy or the whisper of the wind, or the faint rustle of wind beats high, high. The model would not show itself, not even his shadow. She would return home and work determinedly through the dark hours until she laid the brushes aside again, come dawn. Half a dozen times she finished and slept, and one blustering sunset found her with nothing left to do. Not that the painting was perfect. She eyed it critically from every angle, brushes poised in her fingers, palette in the crook of her arm. She approached it several times, as if, as if to lay another stroke upon the canvas, then drew back. The paint was very thick in some places, but she knew another layer would not make it better. The painting was beyond her ability to improve. She set her brushes aside and went out to walk. Lydia understood the limits of her skill. She did not expect the canvas to be a photographic reproduction of the image in her mind's eye. She knew she would have to be satisfied with the faintest hint of the beauty and grace and power of the original. And down by the shore, in the pale light of the full moon, she had to weep for her own limitations. She wept and she shivered a little because the night was very chill and her coat was not quite heavy enough. High above her head, she heard his wings. She knew the sound instantly and looked up straining to pierce the darkness, her tears a chilly patch upon each eye, blurring her vision for a moment. As a blur, she saw him silhouetted against the moon. Then she blinked and brought him into sharp focus. He was poised above the shimmering path that the moon laid down on the surface of the sea, his great wings motionless as he glided lower, lower, almost touching the white-topped waves. An eagle, yes. She'd been right all along, all the time, right in every detail, even to the amber eye that glittered with moonlight, glittered as it regarded her. He swooped toward her, his dark wings blotting out the moon, the sky, the world. She gazed at him in wonder, in adoration. The painting had not matched his true size, not remotely. He was the grandfather of eagles, she thought, the god of eagles. She felt a great gust of air as he hovered over her a moment, and then, as delicately as she might cradle a kitten, his great talons locked about her waist and hips. Her hair blew wild as his pinions cupped air to rise again, and her feet floated free of the earth. Upward they soared, upward. The rushing wind was a tonic for Lydia's soul. She felt light, young, and beautiful as the bird himself. Looking down, she could see the silver moon path flowing far below. Eastward they flew, eastward toward Europe. As the first rays of sunlight spread out over the ocean, Lydia saw the island. The only land visible from horizon to horizon was dominated by a huge mountain. As they drew closer, she realized that the summit of that mountain was their destination. This did not surprise her, or else she reasoned would an eagle rest. Closer still, and she saw the nest, because her parents' house, built of bushes and driftwood and spars from sailing ships, some with ropes and tattered canvas still clinging to, clinging to them. And then at the last moment, just before her feet touched the soft shadowed interior of the nest, just before they brushed the lining of feathers torn from the bird's own downy breast and his mates, she struggled. Poor, dried-up spinster, she struggled, weakly, as she fell toward their small, dark, gaping beaks.